For over a century, the calorie has been associated with energy, diets, and nutrition. Most people believe that a calorie is a unit of measurement that tells us how much energy we get from the foods and drinks we consume and how much energy we lose while performing physical activities. Yet, many people don't know what the calorie means or why the word is supposed to be capitalized when referring to the energy value of foods and drinks, while many others believe that the solution for maintaining an optimal physical shape and avoiding all sorts of diseases is counting calories. If they eat more of these units of measurement than they burn, they'll gain weight, while if they eat fewer calories than they burn, they'll lose weight. However, although being present on almost all food labels and arguably the favorite unit of energy in common speech and public nutrition education, the nutritional calorie has not been defined anywhere in the scientific nomenclature. Ever since 1960, when scientists adopted the International System of Units, or, for short, the SI, the official unit for work, heat, and energy, is the joule. Neither the calorie nor the kilocalorie is an SI unit, and in most of the countries that have adopted the SI, the energy is expressed primarily in kilojoules. To complicate things even more, in the USA, the energy is expressed in calories, while the values for protein, fat, carbohydrates, sodium, cholesterol, as well as the values found on medical prescriptions and over-the-counter drugs, are expressed in grams and milligrams, which are subunits of the SI unit for weight, the kilogram. So, let's begin this short series of videos on nutrition by understanding what a calorie means, how scientists have determined the energy requirements of the human body, and also, let's familiarize ourselves with some very popular words, such as temperature, heat, or energy, which, although are widely used in everyday speech, very few people realize what they mean. The earliest record of the word calorie is found in a French Journal of Industry and Sciences published in 1825, and it had nothing to do with the energy value of foods and drinks. For example, we found that one kilogram of hydrogen melts 300 kilograms of ice. The apparatus is constructed in such a way that it cannot escape the smallest portion of heat. Consequently, the maximum heat is obtained. On the other hand, one kilogram of water at 75 degrees melts one kilogram of ice at zero degrees. Thus, one kilogram of hydrogen will be able to raise to 75 degrees 300 kilograms of water. This phrase is attributed to one of the most noted chemists and physicists of that period, Nicolas Clement, professor of applied chemistry at the French National Conservatory of Arts and Crafts in Paris. He was particularly interested in the study of heat, approaching theories on how steam engines convert heat into useful work. Following his hypothesis, Mr. Clement imagined a unit of heat that he calls calorie. A calorie is the amount of heat needed to raise with 1 degree Celsius 1 kilogram of water. It will take 75 calories to melt a kilogram of ice. With his imaginary unit of heat, Professor Clement became known among his students as Mr. Calorie, and he further developed methods for determining the amount of energy that could be obtained from coal. After numerous experiments, he concluded that charcoal has an energy content of 7,050 calories per kilogram, and to convert one kilogram of water into steam would require 750 calories. Clement's calculations were accepted by the engineers of that period, and, by the 1840s, the calorie entered the French dictionaries and physics texts as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. However, although very popular in engineering and physics, Clement's unit of heat wasn't so widely known in other fields of science. Almost three decades after Nicolas Clement acquired the nickname Mr. Calorie, in 1852, the French scientists Pierre Antoine Fauve and Jean Silberman came up with another calorie. Yet, as opposed to Professor Clement, Fauve and Silberman were performing in chemistry labs studies on heats of oxidation of acids and bases and were experimenting with smaller quantities of substance. Thus, their calorie was based on a mass of one gram. They published extensively their work in many prominent chemical journals and are mistakenly credited even by the 20th century biographies and dictionaries with naming the calorie. Nonetheless, the only unit for energy defined in the 19th century dictionaries was Clement's calorie, namely the quantity of heat necessary to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius.
In 1879, the French chemist and politician Marcelin Berthelot noticed that there were two meanings for the same word. He settled the confusion by defining the lowercase calorie as a gram calorie, he used the capitalized calorie to refer to the kilogram calorie and equaled 1,000 gram calories with 1 kilogram calorie. Later dictionaries adopted this custom and began referring to small and large calories. In about the same period, and completely unrelated to the French discoveries, the German physicist Julius Mayer was also trying to find a relationship between heat and energy. He is known today for enunciating one of the first statements of the conservation of energy, namely that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, and he was the first German scientist who introduced, in 1845, the word calorie in German publications, recommending the use of the kilogram meter system as a common unit of work and energy. In Germany, the story from France repeated itself. The German physiologist Karl von Voigt was interested in the energy produced by animal bodies. Based on the assumption that fat and similar substances are heat producers and nitrogen-containing substances are energy producers, Voigt theorized that an animal can be brought into a state that he termed nitrogenous equilibrium, a condition in which the nitrogen contained in the food eaten is equal to the nitrogen eliminated out of the body through urine and feces. Voigt performed a series of experiments, mainly on dogs, under various conditions of fasting, all meat diets, all fat feeding process, on various lengths of time, and so on. The basic principle was the same in all his experiments. After the dog was allowed to eat a controlled portion of food, Voigt was measuring the amount of nitrogen in the dog's excrements and compared it to the nitrogen he assumed was contained in the dog's food. To determine the influence of the previous diet on the urea, after feeding the dog, Voigt was starving the animal for a certain period, usually a week, and sometimes, even more. Because he wasn't able to measure the quantity of nitrogen eliminated by the dog through sweat, Voigt went so far that he collected the hair in the epidermis from a dog for 565 days and concluded that the animal had a daily average output of fur and skin of 1.2 grams, containing 0.18 grams of nitrogen. A more detailed description of the earliest experiments for determining the energy requirements of animal bodies can be found in Graham Lusk's book, The Elements of the Science of Nutrition, published in 1906, and also in David Broward's book, How Many Calories Should We Eat?, published in 2020. I posted the links in the description, yet, I should warn you that some of the experiments and the cruelty with which the scientists were treating the dogs may shock you. To determine how much of each foodstuff is burned in the human body, Voigt suggested to Max Petten Koffer, his teacher at the University of Munich, the construction of an apparatus, which consisted of a small room, well ventilated by a current of air. They determined the input and the output of chemical elements from within the chamber by measuring the amount of water and carbon dioxide from the air that was entering the chamber, as well as from the air pumped out of the room and by comparing the results with other control experiments, such as burning a candle or evaporating a known weight of water within a room. They found the levels of chemical elements acceptable, within a small percentage of error, and performed their experiments based on Voigt's theory of nitrogenous equilibrium, namely that the nitrogen contained in the food eaten is equal to the nitrogen eliminated out of the body through urine and feces. However, as a quick observation, things are not so simple as Voigt and Pettenkofer believed. The energy expenditure of the human body cannot be determined based on the assumption that fat and similar substances are heat producers and nitrogen-containing substances are energy producers. There are over 90 naturally occurring chemical elements, and most of them, even the radioactive element potassium, play an important part in the nutrition of all living things. Also, the human body is designed to run primarily on water and minerals, whereas water is known as the universal solvent because it can dissolve and dissociate more particles than any other substance, and that includes not only valuable chemicals, minerals, and nutrients, but also harmful chemicals, pesticides, and countless other pollutants. And, because all the human body's major organs and fluids are made mostly of water, every single chemical element we absorb, either through respiration, ingestion, or through the skin, 
is carried by the universal solvent throughout the body, affecting to a greater or lesser extent every single function and structure of the body. In fact, even the U.S. Food and Drug Administration defines a drug as any substance other than food intended to affect the structure or any function of the body, and if you look closely at the chemical composition of any drug, you'll notice the preponderance of three chemical elements, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. For instance, the well-known aspirin has the chemical formula C9H8O4, ibuprofen contains 13 atoms of carbon, 18 of hydrogen and 2 of oxygen, while paracetamol is nothing more than C8H9NO2. Even caffeine and the so-called recreational drugs such as drinking alcohol, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, LSD, or THC contain mainly hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Another aspect that we have to take into consideration is that a human being can live weeks and even months without solid food and can survive for days without drinking water. Yet, a couple of minutes without oxygen leads inevitably to death. The same oxygen accounts for a whopping 65% of the human body's mass, followed by carbon, 18%, and hydrogen, 10%. By comparison, nitrogen, which Boyd and Petten Kofer assumed to be energy producer, accounts for only 3% of the human body's mass. Moreover, not only that Boyd and Petten Kofer's experiments defied the rigor of mathematical calculations, too many factors were neglected as being too small in starvation or negligible to influence the final results, but their approach clearly violated the well-established laws of thermodynamics, which I'll present in detail in the third part of this series. Nevertheless, according to Void and Petten Kofer's first experiment, a 71-kilogram male, who, during 24 hours, wasn't allowed to eat any solid food and drank only about 1 liter of water, had an energy expenditure of 2,250,000 calories, while the metabolism on a medium diet was 2,400,000 calories. This is a tremendous amount of energy, and for you to comprehend its magnitude, I'll present you with a simple experiment that you can do at home. Take a pot, put some ice in it, place the pot on the stove, and turn on the heat. You'll notice that after a couple of seconds, the ice will start to melt. If you'd stick a thermometer in the pot when the ice is half melted, you'll read a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water will stay at this temperature until all the ice is melted. This means that the energy coming from the heat is used to melt the ice and not to raise the water's temperature. If you'll keep adding heat, the water will slowly reach 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and it will stay at this temperature, continuously absorbing energy from the heat until all the water turns into steam. That's because water requires huge amounts of energy to change its temperature, and I already posted on my channel a video on this topic, which I strongly encourage you to check it out. Anyway, what I tried to show is that, Contrary to what most people believe, the human body needs, and uses, tremendous amounts of energy. For instance, if we'd convert those 2,250,000 small calories resulted in Voigt's experiment for a fasting individual, into Clement's large calories, the resulting energy would be enough to warm up to 1 degree Celsius, the water from a swimming pool, measuring approximately 50 meters long, by 22 meters wide, and 2 meters deep, or to melt an impressive quantity of 30 kilograms of ice. Or, as another analogy, when you have a fever and your body is raising its temperature from, say, 38 to 39 degrees Celsius, it would be like warming up to 1 degree Celsius, a quantity of water equal to approximately 60 to 70 percent of your body's weight, not to mention the fact that in case of an illness or an infection, the exchange of energy happens so quickly that very often, the body is raising its temperature to 1 degree Celsius in less time than it takes you to make a soup. You have to admit, you'd need a pretty big pot in which to put a quantity of water equal to about 70% of your body's weight, but which would be quite small, compared to the size of the pool from the first example. And, as a final observation regarding the earliest experiments for determining the energy requirements of the human body, Voigt's estimations for a fasting individual are higher than those 2,000 calories used today for general nutrition advice, and in the fourth part of this series, I'll present the reason why nutritionists, or rather the U.S. government, decided in the late 1960s to reduce the energy requirements for the entire U.S. population, a recommendation that has been adopted since then all over the world.
So, if you haven't done it already, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. For now, let's return to the controversial history of the calorie and let's see how scientists have determined the energy value of protein, carbs, and fat.